morning, beloved. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this service of worship on this very chilly day. It's good for us to be together, whether you're here in the room or whether you're joining us online. I would like to uh, mention, uh, if you're in the room, please put your pl uh, phones on airplane mode. If you're online, don't put your phones on airplane mode. That would be counterproductive. But if you're in the room, go to airplane and that will help us with our streaming. Couple things going on. Um, confirmation class is tonight at five o'clock. Uh, and I see that some of you are in the room and I know some of you are here to do your homework and that's a good thing. Uh, as we gather, uh, I also want to point out this should be in the bulletin that you may have in your hands or you may have downloaded. But we are looking for somebody who can help be a ministry coordinator for our emergency food program. We uh, have a partnership with the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank and for a number of months this year we have uh, been able to connect with uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 families here in the community to give them two big boxes of food each month. There's a lot of folks who are willing to participate in that program but we don't have anybody who has stepped up to say let me help administrate that. And that's what we need. So if you have uh, the ability to send some emails and to make contact and to, to work with a group of folks who are passionate about helping folks in need, uh, I believe that the contact person is Sher is it Sherry? So contact Sherry Mack. She's in the room here in the red sweater, or you can send her an email. I want to uh, tell you a couple things. Uh, first of all, the Tuesday morning group this week, the Tuesday morning group will not be meeting. Um, and uh, you can talk to Danny and Barb about that, but the Tuesday group is not meeting. Uh, and then um, two things I want to point out. One, three weeks from today, uh, we have the opportunity and the great privilege to share in a worship experience called The Things That We Share. Our own friend Lucas and our friend Kenny Stockard. Some of you will remember a couple years ago, it, it's a gospel concert featuring uh, African-American spirituals and how they have contributed to our shared understanding of what it means to be a human being. Uh, it, uh, it was an amazing experience when we did it a couple years ago, uh, and uh, I can't wait for it to be. It's three weeks from today on the 27th, um, and I'm going to just tell you it's going to be better in the room than it will be online. Uh, so I want to uh, make sure that you have that on your calendars. Uh, and then the last thing that I want to mention, um, have you ever taken a trip that has changed your life? Maybe it's been a mission trip that you've been on, maybe it was a family vacation, maybe you were just uh, on your way to the mall with your mom and something clicked. But a trip where you came back from that experience and you knew that something was different, and so you've always looked at this, or you've always thought about that the same, in a different way ever since. Um, we're gonna be talking about the power of trips, the power of journeys um, uh, during Lent this year, and if you've taken a trip that has affected you, I would love to hear about that. Give me a call, shoot me a text, uh, talk to me after church, but I would love to hear about the trips that have changed you and have affected your life. That's what I have. Uh, I would invite you now to stand and Jacob will call us into worship. The call to worship. We come to worship today determined to follow the Christ who calls us to a new way of life. We come to, to worship with open hearts and minds and spirits ablaze for justice and equality. We come to meet God and each other. Let us worship in love and understanding.
you pray with me, please? Oh God, forgive us when we fail to respond to your call, unity in our families, our church, and our world. Forgive us when we are bound by our narrow understandings of discipline. Forgive us when we turn our backs on opportunities to secure a place in your beloved community. Forgive us when we make excuses to be advocates of fairness and justice for the oppressed. Forgive us when we fail to acknowledge each other. And we continue. Dear God, through your Holy Spirit, we are drawn to the Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves in discipleship, and through your Holy Spirit, we seek the fallen, loving ways of our brother Jesus. Amen. While it is true that we have sinned, it is greater truth that we have forgiven through Christ's love and through Christ. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say, in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. Thanks. You have declared that your kingdom is among us. Open our eyes to see it, our ears to hear it, and our hearts to hold it, our hands to serve it. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory with all of his angels, he will sit on his royal throne. The people of all nations will be brought before him, and he will separate them. As, she as shepherds separate their sheep from their goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, My father has blessed you. Come and receive the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world was created. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. And when I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. When I was sick, you took care of me. And when I was in jail, you visited me. Then the ones who please the Lord will ask, when did we give you something to eat or drink? When did we welcome you as a stranger, give you clothes to wear, visit you while you were, in sick, while you were sick or in jail? The king will answer, whenever, wh whenever you did it for any of my people, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you did it for me. Then the king will say to those on his left, get away from me, you are under God's curse. Go into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry but you did not give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, but you did not give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, but you did not welcome me. And I was naked, but you did not give me any clothes to wear. I was sick and in jail, but you did not take care of me. Then the people ask, Lord, di when did we fail to help you when you were hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in jail? The king will say to them, 
Whenever you fail to help any of my people, no matter how unimportant they seem, you failed to do it for me. Then Jesus said, those people will be punished forever, but the ones who please God will have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. I'd like to ask if the children would come forward for a few minutes with the children's sermon, please. And as you're coming up, it's important that you'll be able, I have some pictures to show you. And maybe the people at home, Sharon, will want to see these pictures too. Okay. All right. Welcome, welcome. I'm glad that you're here today. Is one Asha coming up too? Wonderful, wonderful. And here comes Judah. Let's everybody scooch this way a little bit. And if you're right there, uh, Levi, can you still see the screen? Beautiful, beautiful. Man, nobody likes to sit in front of church, huh? <laughs> All right, hey, how's everybody doing today? It is, it, is it a good day? Good. Do you know, I'm so happy to be here. When I woke up this morning... No power at my house. Whew, it was so cold, my furnace didn't work overnight. But my voice is getting louder, how about that? My furnace didn't work, I was so cold. I was so glad to come here where it's warm and light and I'm able to see you. I need you to help me with a couple things. Let's take a look. I'm going to ask you, I have some pictures. If you could turn that down a little bit, Steve, that seems a little, yeah. Uh, I have some pictures, and I want to ask you, what do you think you know about the people who are in these pictures? So this first picture, what do you think you know about this person? Does anybody have any, any thoughts about what this person, maybe where this person lives, or what this person's life is like? Any ideas? That's right, this person belongs to a family. That's good. Any other ideas about maybe where this person lives? In a home, right? This person, would you be surprised if I tell you that this is a child who lives in a place called Africa? This is a place called, I bet Monasha knows this, Malawi. This is a child who lives in Malawi. Does that make sense to you? Can you sort of see? That looks just like, that's Mornasha. That's Mornasha, and she's from Malawi. That's right. Okay, well, let's take a look at the next one. Hmm. Does, do you think that these children live in homes? Okay, that's the same. Um, do you think that they live in families? Yeah. Do you think that they might be from Malawi? No, no, probably not. Do you think that they're from Africa? No. Where do you think they might be from? Go ahead, Micah. China. That's right. This is a group of Chinese children getting ready to dance. Because they... Do these children look different from the girl in the last picture? They, they do look a little different. Go ahead, back one. You see? And then the next one. They look a little different, right? Now let's do the next one. Any ideas where these people might live? They do live in a family. That's right. What do you think, Levi? Yes, these are people called Inuit, and they live uh, up in Alaska or in Canada, uh, or even some of them live in northern Russia and so on. But what makes you think that, that they live there? What do you think, Brogan? Yeah, their house is made out of ice and snow. So could you live in a house like this in Africa? <laughs> I don't think so. No. And do the people in this picture... Penguins do live in Africa, but not as icy as that. Do these people look like, let's go back and back. Now go forward and one more. They look even more different. And 
And really, none of the people in any of those pictures looks like Brogan. Right? Or, or you. That's right. Well, everybody looks a little bit different. Now let's take the next picture. Hmm. That's a skeleton. Where do you think where do you think those people might live? <laughs> At Halloween, that's right. Can can you tell can you tell anything about the people? Do they do they have black skin or brown skin or pink skin? What do you think? Can you tell that from looking at their bones? No, we can't. We can't tell anything. Here's the thing. How many of you have pinkish whitish skin? How many of you have brown skin? How many of you have purple skin? No, you do not. You like purple, though. How many? So, so in that way, we're different. We're different because of the way that we look on the outside. How many of you have a skeleton? Oh, we all. We have to have a skeleton to be a human being, don't we? That's right. If we didn't have a skeleton, we'd be like a pile of jello. Yeah, and we don't want that. The thing that we're going to talk about in just a minute, Miss Becky's going to read a Bible passage from the Bible, and she's going to remind us that God doesn't necessarily, God doesn't look at what we look at on the outside. God made us on the inside. And while we look different on the outside, we're all the same inside. We're all beautiful to God. We're all made to look like God on the inside. That's what counts. So, on the outside, we're all different. Let's pray. Can we pray together? God, we thank you that you make us, uh, and we thank you that you make us to be people who are supposed to be like you. Help us to pay attention to what's on the inside more than what's on the outside. Help us to love you and to love our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends, for coming up. second scripture reading is from Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through 29. But now you have arrived at your destination. By faith in Christ you are in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in adult faith wardrobe. Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. In Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, heirs according to the covenant promises. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. So uh, about 10 years or so ago, I was invited to meet with Her Excellency Joyce Banda, who was at that time the president of the nation of Malawi. When she received me, she showed me some climate forecasts uh, for Central Africa, and she shared her concern that a famine was headed towards her home. Some of you will remember the initiative that came out of that conversation, a famine relief program that we called Amazing Grace. Working with our partners and the Malawian government, this effort provided enough corn, or maize, uh, to help eight villages weather a very difficult season. Participating in that effort 
remains one of the singular privileges of my life. As we worked to develop a plan that would bring relief to our friends, I learned a lot about a number of things. I learned, for instance, that as it turns out, corn can be quite difficult to grow in Malawi. Corn needs regular watering, but never too much water. Uh, it's hard on the soil because it depletes the natural nutrients much more quickly than they can be replenished. And my Malawian friends often talk about their need for chemical fertilizer as a route to any kind of a harvest at all. So as I was meeting with some of the folks who received this food assistance in Amazing Grace, I said, well, I, I'm glad that we can help in this particular moment, but I wonder, what did people in Malawi eat before we ate maize? And when I asked it the first time, the people looked at me as if I'd never been to Africa before, uh, and they said reassuringly, oh, Abusa, we've always eaten maize. And, and I persisted, and I said, yeah, I know that for my entire life, maize has been the staple food in Malawi, but before I was born, what did the people in Malawi eat? And, and they looked at me as if I had sprouted a third eye or maybe a second nose. Uh, Abusa... Our parents ate maize, our grandparents ate maize, their parents ate maize. M maybe you're talking about cassava. But, but here's the deal. Maize is a new world crop. Just like cassava, it was cultivated first in the Americas. Neither of these crops occurs naturally in Malawi or anywhere in Africa, but today, Malawi is the planet's second largest consumer of corn per capita. And the typical Malawian consumes an astounding 1,150 daily calories from maize. And as you've heard, most of my friends in Malawi cannot imagine life without maize, even though maize is not a crop native to Africa. So why am I telling you this? What does this story about African agriculture have to do with our congregation or worship or Matthew 25 or Galatians 3? Well, let's take a look at the scripture. This week, we are returning to Matthew 25. And as Marissa was uh, developing the bulletin for this week, she brought it to me, she said, Dave, you made a mistake. We, we had Matthew 25 last week. What's the passage that you want for this week? And I assured her that this was not an accident. We are revisiting this story about the shepherd with his sheep and his goats. And spoiler alert, you're going to have the same story next week, too, as we continue to engage with what it means for us to be a Matthew 25 congregation in the Presbyterian Church USA. The scene depicts a reunion between a Jesus who has been absent and those who belong to his flock. And it's crucial to note here that the Son of Man, that, that Jesus, and everyone else in the story acknowledges that there is a reality wherein some people will experience hunger, thirst, isolation, rejection, disease, and injustice. There's nothing in the story to indicate why life is that way, but nobody in the story acts as if any of these things is a surprise. They understand that's how life is. These things happen. In that context, then, Jesus commends those who were attentive to him as he suffered such pain, disorientation, and injustice. And at the same time, he excoriates those who were oblivious to his condition. And when he does this, both groups, the sheep and the goats, are surprised. The, the, the sheep respond essentially by saying, wait, what? That was you? Jesus, no way! I didn't even recognize you! And the goats, on the other hand, are either defensive or indignant or both. Are you kidding me, Jesus? Oh, look, if we'd have known it was you, we'd have hooked you up with a box of food from the food bank or at least a, a giant eagle gift card for crying out loud. We didn't know it was you. And here's something else worth noting. 
Nowhere in the parable does Jesus say or do anything to indicate that anybody, sheep or goat, is devoid of compassion, is unwilling to act in some fashion. He, Jesus never once suggests that the so-called goats were unable or unwilling to offer assistance, companionship, kindness, or love to others. He doesn't say any of that. He simply says, you never offered any of that to me. And when they protest, he says, you never did it to those who were on the margins, and so you didn't do it for me. And if I'm right about what I just said, and, and I think I am, really, I, I think that that suggests that somehow there arose within the Christian community a category of Jesus' follower which found it possible somehow to determine which people were deserving of the kindness that was shown to them and which people were unworthy. There's not the slightest indication that the goats were at all uncomfortable with the practice and theology of labeling. What appalled them, or maybe even horrified them, was the thought that they had somehow mislabeled Jesus. They didn't have a problem with labels. They were just afraid that they had put the wrong label on Jesus. I've mentioned previously that the Matthew 25 initiative in the PCUSA contains three main points. Congregational vitality, dismantling structural racism, and eradicating systemic poverty. Last week we considered congregational vitality, and today I'd like us to consider what it would mean to follow Jesus in such a way as to oppose and ultimately dismantle racism. Oxford English Dictionary defines racism as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on a belief that one's own race is superior. And when we add structural to racism, it means that we clearly acknowledge that in all kinds of ways, people who have devised ways uh, to, to people who have power have devised ways to consolidate that power and to perpetuate their advantage. In many of our lifetimes, we have seen how difficult it has been for black and brown people to get loans, to live in certain neighborhoods, or to find any kind of equity when it comes to the educational structures within their communities. This morning, I'd like to point out that one of the most devious means that people in power ever developed to keep someone in their place was simply this to invent the concept of race altogether. I do not think that the idea of race in human relationships makes any more sense than the idea of corn in Malawi. Now look, I was having a discussion once and the other person said, Dave, if racism is such a big deal, why didn't Jesus ever talk about it? Well, the world in which Jesus lived didn't understand race and ethnicity anything like the ways that we have been trained to. People talked about having a particular ancestry or having come from a certain place, but, but there was no sense ever that there was a biological difference between people with different physical characteristics. The concept of race is fairly modern. It was German scientist Johann Blumenbach who in 1776 published On the Natural Variety of Mankind. And in that book, he announced that there were five categories of humans. Caucasian, the white race. Mongolian, the yellow race. Malayan, the brown race. Ethiopian, the black race. And American, the red race. Uh, Blumenbach's theories were widely shared, particularly amongst those of European descent. After all, if there were, in fact, different categories of people, different types of human beings that could be differentiated according to the best medical science and thereby have the most appropriate label slapped on them, somehow be superior, while others would be inferior to one extent or another. 
And if white people were deemed to be the superior race, then it would be just a matter of simple logic for them to justify their own rights and freedoms while simultaneously exploiting or enslaving their inferiors of another race. That kind of thinking spread quickly and became enshrined in all kinds of places, including the Constitution of the United States, which allowed that enslaved African Americans ought to be counted at a, way, at a rate of three-fifths of a person for each European American. The idea of race as a distinction became the norm. And so what I'm suggesting is that just as Everyone in Malawi knows that maize is and always has been the preferred dish and staple crop. So too we in the United States have embraced the concept of race as a means of dividing people one from another. Everyone knows that there are such a thing as black people and white people and that we're different. Recent studies, though, in the field of genetics indicate that there is no place on our DNA where race can be determined. If you were to take one of those ancestry uh, tests, you would determine where your ancestors lived or maybe what kind of conditions people in a similar uh, arrangement as you had endured. But there's no genetic sequence for whiteness or blackness or anything else like that. It appears as though science would reinforce what Paul wrote to his friends in Galatia. There is no reason whatsoever to claim superiority or to show partiality. And, and, and I can hear some of those wheels turning right now, and you're saying, but wait, Dave, if there's no such thing as race, then why are we saying that part of our congregation's mission is to get rid of racism? How can anybody be racist if there's no such thing as race? And I think that's a little bit like saying, why are people in Malawi hungry if there's not supposed to be corn there in the first place? One root cause of famine in Malawi is the fact that five or six hundred years ago, somebody showed up in Africa with some corn and said, hey, you guys are going to love this stuff. The planting of those seeds and the introduction of concepts have consequences. Just as my friends in Malawi, none of my friends in Malawi, can envision a world without maize because that crop has become so deeply ingrained in their national identity, so you and I have lived all of our lives in a culture that is steeped in the effects of the imposition of the concept of race. Let's look at it another way. When my friends from Africa come to visit, I love to take them out on my boat and to show them the city. And I'm here to tell you that every single time, without fail, every single time I've invited a, a person from Malawi or South Sudan on the boat, they say, Abusa, what about the crocodiles? Should we not fear that we will be eaten? And every time I laugh. And I say, no, I guarantee you there are no crocodiles here. There's no such thing as a crocodile in a Pittsburgh River. And sometimes my friends believe me enough to get on the boat with me. But what if somehow, some warm May afternoon, there was an accident and somehow hundreds of crocodiles were released into the three rivers? I know they're not native. I know they don't belong there, but as long as the water is above a certain temperature, they could survive. And so if such a thing were to come to pass, and you knew that there were crocodiles swimming in and around the waters of Point State Park, would you go swimming with me? I don't, I don't think so. In fact, I think we would probably uh, uh, lobby for the establishment of a commission or a committee or a task force whose mandate would be to get those crocs out of the water. We would move swiftly to eradicate them, even though we all know they don't belong there, even though we all know they didn't come from there. They're there. 
The fact that race is a social construct that has been employed by people in power to exercise their advantage over other groups, the fact that race is not real, doesn't mean that people don't experience harmful effects by living in a society built around those norms. We have to acknowledge that racism is the air that we breathe in the United States. It's not a fluke occurrence that shows up here and there. We have, yes, we've made significant progress in, in disarming the blatantly segregationist laws that characterize much of our nation's past, but there's no denying that right now, people of color can experience tremendous difficulties navigating any number of social milestones. Those of African and Hispanic descent, for instance, are far less likely than similarly qualified white people to be approved for loans. They tend to pay more for goods and services such as automobiles. They are statistically more likely to be suspected of being lawbreakers and if arrested are far more likely to face violence from or within the criminal justice system. So what I'm saying is that while there's no such thing as race, we are living in a world that appears to have been built around the notion that not only race is a thing, but it's one of the most important things about you. There are countless opportunities or incentives that seek to subjugate people or demean them or to convince them to settle for less than their peers who have a different skin tone or who have been assigned a different label. And yet Matthew 25, Galatians 3 make it clear that in the life of a disciple there is no excuse for othering someone else. There is no excuse for believing that because a person isn't in the right category or displays features consistent with a certain ethnic identity, that such a person is less deserving of love, compassion, friendship. Inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these, my friends, you have done it to me, says Jesus. Peter's story was a pastor in South Africa who stood up against the racist apartheid regime and he preached who is the focus of the church who is the person we're concerned about the person we exist to serve for Jesus there was no question in the kingdom the humble are lifted high and the most vulnerable have the pride of place that is why you cannot ask Jesus into your heart alone. He will always ask, can I bring my friends? And you will look at his friends, and they will consist of the poor, and the marginalized, and the oppressed, and you will hesitate. But Jesus is clear, only if I can bring my friends story is absolutely correct. The work of the church is to make the world hospitable to Jesus and his friends. Whoever and however, wherever and whenever we might meet them. And for many of, this, this, for many of us, this is profoundly uncomfortable because so many of Jesus' friends are marginalized or undocumented. A lot of them are on the other side of the political spectrum from where we think we ought to be. Most of them don't look like you. And that is not important. Let us pledge ourselves to doing all that is within our power to construct and participate in a reality that recognizes and affirms the essential humanity of those with whom we share this neighborhood, this city, this nation, this globe. Let us refuse to tolerate the demonization or subjugation of one who appears different and instead work to bring about a world where no one is left wanting. That world is not the one in which we grew up, but it is the way that it is intended to be and it can be how we live together in the days to come. Thanks be to God for those who join us in seeking to reconnect with the call of Christ to live with compassion and love. Amen.
Friends, we now have the privilege to uh, come together and to share the things that have brought us together in prayer uh, or have maybe been weighing heavily on our own hearts and minds. Um, I was asked um, to uh, have you please pray with special intention uh, for folks who are struggling with sobriety. Uh, there are a number of folks in our community who have been touched uh, and uh, one person asked, could we please offer a prayer for folks who struggle with sobriety? Uh, I will tell you that uh, Joe Mel uh, continues uh, to experience life with great difficulty now. Uh, he has been um, uh, taken for nursing care in Baldwin. Uh, and so we want to pray for Joe and his wife Mary and, of course, son Josh and Josh's family. I invite you to pray for Steve's aunt, Amana, who was hospitalized in Harrisburg. Uh, prayers for Marge Freeman, who has a new address, um, and I think that will probably be published somewhere at some point, uh, but Marge has, uh, the, the Rosewood has closed, and so Marge has transitioned into a new place, and so we want to pray for Marge in this time of transition. Um, and I would share with you the news. Uh, we have been praying for Tim Propelka. Uh, Tim passed away on Friday night uh, in uh, Mercy ICU, or Friday morning, rather, in the ICU at Mercy. He'll be laid out tomorrow from 2 to 4 and 6 to 8 at Slater's on Mount Washington. It's on Virginia Avenue on Mount Washington. Uh, and there'll be a memorial service here in the church at 1030 on Tuesday morning. If you're on the church email list, all that's going to come to you in an email in about an hour and a half. Uh, but uh, the arrangements for Tim, and it's also in today's paper. Uh, concurrently, we want to pray uh, for Norma Shirey. That's Tim's friend. He's brought her to worship a number of times in these past months. Norma's scheduled for heart surgery, a valve replacement surgery this month. Uh, so prayers uh, for, for Norma as well. Now I'm going to try to see if I can defeat my bad hearing by coming a little closer and asking, are there things that you have held in your hearts and minds as matters of prayer? Sharon. Prayers for uh, the, the Cohen family. Sharon's Aunt Addie passed away this morning in Colorado. Uh, and prayers for Caden, a four-year-old uh, who uh, fractured his skull uh, while he was sledding the other day and is in the ICU at Children's. Ronnie. Yeah, 
Yeah, the Gilarovskis can't catch a break, and today their uh, uh, water was having trouble, and before that it was the plumbing and the heating, and so yeah, prayers for the Gilarovskis trying to catch a break. Prayers of joy for Ron having experienced surgery and being able to see uh, clear, more clearly now than uh, for, a, I'll just say, a while. Um, and uh, prayers for the family of John who passed away. Uh, and uh, now folks are coming together. Yeah, Debbie. Mm. Yes. Yeah. In the NICU. Do you know his first name? Michael. Michael. Prayers for Michael in the NICU at McGee since Thanksgiving. Yeah, for, for Michael, uh, uh, all kinds of tests and, and problems for Michael and for his grandma, Missy, one of Deb's friends. Anything else? Megan. I have a joy for my friend, Julie. Um, they had found some cysts on her ovaries and they were worried if it would be cancerous, but she had a successful surgery on Friday and is doing well and it was just an ovarian cyst. Um, but so she's doing well, so prayers for her healing. Wonderful. I won't repeat that because that went into the microphone and all of you could hear that. Friends, let's now continue and, and uh, lift up our prayer. Lord, we ask that as we come together as your people, that you would give to us uh, the ability to see each other the way that you see us. We pray that we might let go of matters of appearance or condition or geography, that we might uh, be free to love and pour out ourselves in the lives of each other. We pray against any kind of artificial barrier and ask for true reconciliation and hope to come to typify our existence. We raise up those whom we have uh, noted uh, who are hospitalized and who are struggling with their health. We pray for those who are in grief. We lift up those who are in fear because the diagnosis is unknown and the waiting is just so much every day and every day and every day. And even as we uh, use the, the idea of famine as an illustration for a sermon, we are aware of the fact that around the world right now there are far too many people who don't have enough to eat. And we pray that you would use us in some way uh, to be an answer to some of those prayers. We pray that we might find a way to meet those needs and we pray that we might find a way to construct a way of living that reduces the occurrence of those things. We ask, Lord, that we might be attentive to who you are and the ways you're working in the world, that we might be attentive to you in the face of the other. Our travel and our ability to communicate with each other. We ask, Lord, that you would bind us together in the common humanity that you have given us and, and remind us of our uh, union as being made in your image. And we ask that you would allow us to forget anything that would detract from that. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen your church around the world uh, to be your servant, to make known your ways, and to shower your love on this world. And to use even us in that process, we pray in the name of Jesus who teaches us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us be faithful stewards of our time, our talents, and our money, so that our treasure is in heaven and our giving pleases God. Though a plate will not be passed <clears throat> to collect the offering, you are encouraged to place your offering in the boxes mounted at the back of the sanctuary now or as you exit today. Those who are worshiping online will find instructions on the screen. prayer of dedication. O oh God, our offerings proclaim that work and worship are one, that life is undivided. Use these gifts for your church's ministries of reconciliation, service, and mercy. Amen. Beloved, go out into the world in peace and have courage. Hold on to that which is good and return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the suffering and honor everybody. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. And let all of God's people say, Amen.